1834, a new law went into effect in Great Britain that shattered the lives of single mothers, forcing them into unimaginable circumstances. Many of these desperate women faced the heart-wrenching choice of surrendering their beloved children into the care of baby farmers. What awaited these innocent souls was beyond comprehension, the stuff of parents' nightmares. Hey y'all, I'm Christina and you're listening to History and Hearsay. Just a quick warning, today's episode does tackle a sensitive topic, but don't worry, I won't be getting into any explicit details. I will primarily be exploring the historical context that led to the atrocious acts of these so-called baby farmers. If you're interested in delving more into the specific details of the baby farmers and their victims, check out all of the information in this episode's description or the show notes below. The Victorian era was a challenging time, especially for women. Society placed immense pressure on them to maintain purity, not just in body, but also in mind. And this meant they were often kept in the dark about things in order to keep their minds pure. And as a result, women were isolated from the public realm in a way that hindered their access to independence and knowledge. For a woman, her virtue and respectability provided her only means of advancement in the world. And for the working class women, this posed a problem because while they needed to work for financial support, they were often placed in situations that took away their ability to hold on to their virtue. Most of the jobs available to women at this time were live in positions like being domestic servants. And unfortunately, this meant easier access for their male acquaintances, family members, employers, or even strangers to take advantage. Once a woman lost her innocence, her life was metaphorically and sometimes literally over. Everything hinged on reputation. If a woman was respectable, she would have an easier time finding a job. If she lost that respectability, she would be unable to find gainful employment, which in turn meant she could not provide for herself or any dependents that she might have. And she would also carry around the stigma associated with being a fallen woman, regardless of whether she had consented to the act or not. This is even more sad when you think about the fact that the majority of these women may not have even been at the age of a consent. Records during that time period reveal that the majority of these unwed mothers who were seeking assistance were between the ages of 14 and 20 years old. And because of the stigma surrounding being an unwed mother during this time, many single women who found themselves pregnant were unable to find employment, and so they heavily relied on the aid afforded them by the poor law. Poor law in Britain was a body of laws meant to provide relief for the poor. These were developed in 16th century England and maintained with various changes until after World War II. These laws made a distinction between the type of help a person was to receive based on whether they were a pauper or just poor. Today when we hear pauper or poor, we may think of these as the same thing. But in Victorian times, there was a clear distinction between the two. A pauper was a person who, through legitimate reasons, was unable to work. Maybe they were disabled or elderly. While a person in poverty, often referred to as the poor or a poor person, was someone who chose not to work even though they were able to. I think some context goes a long way into understanding how women in the Victorian era found themselves in the situations we're discussing in today's episode. So if you're interested in a bit of context, we'll start by explaining how the poor law works. The old poor law was not one law, but a collection of laws that were passed between the 16th and 18th centuries, and they were meant to assist paupers and the poor. And relief under this poor law could take on one of two forms. One was called inside relief, and the other was called outside relief. The able-bodied poor were set to work in a house of industry. They were given material if they needed them to do their job. And because these workers often lived in the workhouses where they were employed, this was called indoor relief. Pauper children were often put to work as apprentices in these workhouses. However, building the different types of workhouses cost a great deal of money. And so these type of workhouses that provided both accommodation and work for the able body were relatively unusual during this time. And outdoor relief was the main form of relief during this period. Since paupers weren't able to work, they were the ones 
typically getting the outdoor relief, relief outside of a workhouse. Typically paupers would be cared for in an almshouse or a poor house, and their relief would often come in the forms of money, food, and clothing. The old poor law established in 1601 said that poor parents and children were responsible for each other, so elderly parents were expected to go and live with their children. This law also set up a system of about 1,500 parishes based on the area around a parish church, and this system offered more sensitivity toward paupers. This poor law operated in a time when the population was still small enough that everybody kind of knew everybody. And so overseers of the poor would know their paupers. Everyone knew who really was unable to work versus who was like an idle poor or someone who was just lazy and trying to take advantage of the situation. And so for this reason, each parish was kind of able to just make their own determination as to who they would assist and how much assistance they would give. Since the parish overseers were able to kind of make their own determinations, you had some parishes that were extremely generous. They went above and beyond what was required of them by law, while other parishes kind of had more stingy or strict overseers who who really kind of only did the bare minimum for people who came to them for assistance. And because of this lack of a set standard, people began to kind of recognize, and I'm sure word of mouth, like, oh, this parish is super generous. This one, they don't want to give anybody anything. They're stingy over here. So let's go to this parish. And so, of course, people were flocking to the parishes that were considered more generous. And this meant that those particular parishes became overrun with people asking for help. And this led to an amendment, which was called the 1662 Poor Relief Act, that required those seeking poor relief to basically prove that they lived in the parish they were requesting assistance from. The original poor law in 1601 was set with the expectation that it was to help paupers and the relief given to the abled body was expected to kind of be like a temporary thing, just a means of getting them back on their feet after a temporary situation like the loss of a job or something like that. Over time, as the population grew and its issues would arise, there were several amending pieces of legislation that could be considered part of the old poor law. And of course, as these amendments were added, it kind of became more and more taxing on the system. And like the Poor Relief Act that I just mentioned, it sounds simple enough, but these things are always more complicated than they sound. Establishing where someone lives when they're homeless is not an easy task. And parishes kind of had to go off of like marriage certificates, or maybe if there was proof that you had family living in the area. And for a lot of people, they didn't have these types of documentations. And so what the parish would do is that they would actually go back to the parish of the person person's birth and say, you belong here. But the problem with that is a lot of times these would be hundreds of miles away and the parish was responsible for getting that person back to the parish of their birth. And every parish along the route was required to feed and house the person for at least one day before sending them along on their journey. And so while this act was supposed to help parishes from paying relief to people who weren't actually part of their parish, it still cost them money to move these people along. As you would probably assume, the relief for the poor was paid for by the upper and middle classes, which usually included people like business owners, property owners, and even tenants. So basically anybody who had enough money to afford to be able to actually rent their own place, and then also farmers, those were the ones paying the taxes that went toward the poor. Late in the 18th century, another amendment supplemented the existing poor law, and this was called the Spien Hamland system. So this system basically took a look at anyone who lived on low wages and they had this complicated system based on how many people were like in your family and all of that. And they used this to determine how much relief you got. And then they supplied them with bread to feed their family or like supplement their income. So the biggest issue with this supplement was that it took the responsibility of paying fair wages away from the companies and placed the burden on the taxpayers. Because of this amendment, many companies chose to pay their employees less and some companies even went so far as to lower the wages for their employees because they knew now that the government would just step in and supplement. And so this system actually ended up causing things to go into a vicious cycle of these business owners, which a lot of times were farmers, having their taxes raised to be able to cover the expanded poor relief. But then these farmers would then struggle to be able to actually pay their employees wages. These employees would then 
turn to the poor relief through the government to supplement their salaries, which would cause taxes to be increased again to try to cover the extra benefits. The resulting increase in expenditures on public relief from the Spin Hamland system was so great that it's considered one of the largest factors that ushered in the new poor law. By the 1830s, there seemed to be an increasing amount of paupers and poor each year. Even though the Napoleonic Wars of the 18th and 19th centuries were coming to an end and Britain was entered a time of peace, costs were continuing to rise and in just a few short years, poor rates increased by 62%. Lawmakers in Great Britain began to speculate that the current poor laws were hurting the populace as a whole more than they were helping the poor. It was clear that something was going to have to change. The proponents for creating a new law felt that the poor relief that was being offered under the old laws had caused the poor to kind of start to see the parish relief as their birthright. And they suspected that more and more people were simply choosing to live off these benefits rather than just working harder to try to increase their station in life. During this time, the population also doubled in a matter of decades, going from 9 million to 18 million. This was primarily because more pauper children were starting to survive past infancy. And while this was definitely a wonderful thing, these families choosing to continue to live off the system was overtaxing it to the point that lawmakers were concerned that eventually the resources would run out and there'd be nothing left for the paupers who truly needed the help. The upper and middle classes whose taxes provided this poor relief began to speculate that they were paying the poor to be lazy and avoid work. After years of complaint from these classes, a royal commission on the poor was appointed in 1832 and its recommendations is what formed the basis for the new poor law as it became known. The new poor law was meant to reduce the cost of looking after the poor and impose a system which would be the same all over the country. So no more having generous parishes and stingy parishes. The new act also helped to address abuses in the old system and they were hoping that this would help to deter voluntary paupers through the establishment of workhouses. There were three essential principles to the origins of this new poor law. The first being that under the new poor law, each parish was grouped into unions and each union had to build a workhouse if they didn't have one already. The second point was that except in very rare special circumstances, poor people could now only get help if they were prepared to leave their homes and go and live in a workhouse. Conditions inside the workhouses were deliberately harsh so that only those who desperately needed help would ask for it. Families were split up and housed in different parts of the workhouses. The poor were made to wear a uniform and the diet was very monotonous. There were also very strict rules and regulations that they had to follow. So whether they were male or female, young or old, they were all made to work really hard. And often they did really unpleasant jobs such as picking oakum, which I have no idea what that is. I guess I should have looked that up. Or even breaking stones, which I don't know why you need to break stones. I guess I should have looked that stuff up, huh? <laughs> Children could also find themselves hired out to actually go and work in factories or mines. And although many people didn't have to go and work in these workhouses, so if somebody became unemployed, sick or old, they were threatened with having to go to one of these workhouses. Over time, workhouses got to the point that they only contained orphaned, the old, the sick, and the insane. Not surprisingly, the new poor law was very unpopular. It seemed to people as though they were being punished simply for being poor. Proponents of this law insisted that it took care of those who truly needed the help and even provided schooling for pauper children. And all they had to do in exchange was just work a few hours a day. One of the members of the committee who opposed the new poor law, Richard Osteller, called the workhouses prisons for the poor. The poor themselves hated and feared the threat of the workhouses so much that there were riots in some towns. The famous book, Oliver Twist, was actually written based on Dickens' personal experiences. Dickens was only 25 when he started writing Oliver Twist, and it was right around the time that this new legislation was beginning to become implemented across the country. Because of his own life experiences, Dickens was against the new changes. He understood that accidents of birth or circumstances could make ordinary individuals vulnerable 
to desperation, hunger, cruelty, or even crime. His own family had been imprisoned in a debtor's prison, and however terrible that experience was for him, he actually knew that it was preferable to being incarcerated in a workhouse. At least in a debtor's prison, families could stay together. The Dickens family lived only a few doors down from a major London workhouse, and because of his intimate knowledge of these workhouses, it's said that Oliver Twist actually closely resembles how it really was in the workhouses, especially when it came to food. The workers received mostly only gruel, soup, small portions of boiled meat, and this broth that was made from the previous day's boiled meat. And there was also a parish rule that specifically forbade second helpings of food, which you guys know the very famous, please sir, I want some more from Oliver Twist. The new poor law was based on a harsher philosophy that regarded pauperism among able-bodied workers as a moral failing. And as such, this law provided no relief for the able-bodied poor except employment in the workhouse with the objective of encouraging people to seek regular employment elsewhere rather than seeking charity. Okay, so now that we have a bit of understanding of how bleak life looked for the underclass in the Victorian era, let's talk about a few other points of the poor law that specifically affected single mothers. In 1810, there was a bill called the Bastard Children Bill. This bill stated that any woman who gave birth to a bastard child, meaning the parents weren't married at the time of the birth, I kind of more prefer the other term they used, which was an illegitimate child, which still sounds terrible. This child would become chargeable to the parish the woman belonged to. So basically this meant that if the child's father wasn't providing financial support, the mother was able to go to the parish in which she lived and get aid from the church in order to feed and clothe herself and her child. She could then charge the man who impregnated her before any justice of the peace, at which time he would be apprehended and jailed until he basically paid the parish back. This bill provided women with the ability to hold the men accountable for their dalliances. However, many saw the bill as unjust and overly harsh toward men because many alleged that women could and would use the bill to entrap men of high birth into supporting children that weren't even their own. Some lawmakers theorized that the greatest contributing factor to the increasing number of paupers were children born out of wedlock. This one guy, Barnett, basically proposed that these bastard laws were a big part of the issue. He felt as though too much help was being given to the unwed mothers, and since the bastard laws were part of the poor laws, the committee members set about reforming those as well. The commissioners argued that by supplying parish aid to these women who were the mothers of illegitimate children, they were basically making it too easy on women to be promiscuous because they could just go to the parish or the child's father for help. The general consensus was that the current laws encouraged women to have illegitimate children. And many of these commissioners didn't think it was right that single women were often given a higher benefit than widows or those with legitimate children. During the debates over this legislation, commissioners supplied evidence that women would perjure themselves in order to gain money, blackmail men in order to get married, and even lie about pregnancy in order to reap the benefits promised to single women. And while I'm sure there probably were instances of this happening, what the committee failed to consider was that many women genuinely depended on this type of poor relief. When the committee asked what changes Mr. Simeon would propose to the bastard laws, he basically said, let's refuse to give these women support from the fathers or the parish and place the burden entirely on the women. <sighs> like what? I mean, I understand there were some serious issues here that definitely needed to be addressed, but how is that the solution that you come up with? Another major issue was that the committee didn't seem to consider whether or not the woman would actually be able to financially support herself. Like how was she going to support herself and a kid? Like they didn't really seem to consider that at all. They just made a blanket statement that a woman should be responsible for caring for her own child. During the debates, those who spoke in support of these new laws basically argued that taking away support from these women would stop them from this immoral behavior. Some members of the opposition defended paternalism and the old bastardy provisions because they understood and saw women as disadvantaged. Not only were women's wages during that time significantly lower than men's, but as they called them, the bastard bearers had the added burden of caring for their child while also trying to earn a living. There were two men, Mr. Bennett and 
and Mr. Cobbett. They seem to be the only two on the committee who really brought these valid concerns to light and they question how is it going to be possible for these women to actually support themselves and children all on their own more support of the law than opposed it so the law eventually pronounced that the mothers of illegitimate children were solely financially responsible for them. Though fornication was a crime it was a higher crime for the mother than it was for the father. Not only did the implementation of the new poor law place the full financial burden on the mother, getting pregnant out of wedlock, as we mentioned earlier, ruined a woman's reputation. And once a woman's reputation was ruined, they were often denied even the lowest form of employment. No one wanted to be associated with the stain that they were considered on society. And this reputation followed them even after they gave birth. Once they had ruined their reputation, it was ruined for the rest of their lives. During the Victorian era, there was a common practice among wealthy women where they would send their infants out to nurse, which meant paying a wet nurse a monthly fee to breastfeed nurse and care for their infant. The child would live with the wet nurse until they were weaned and then they would be returned to their mother. This practice is said to have been started by the royals and aristocrats as a way to have larger families by allowing the women to regain their fertility more quickly. Now, of course, nowadays we know that breastfeeding doesn't stop you from getting pregnant, but many women won't get pregnant while they're breastfeeding. And so there's obviously something to that. After the passing of the new poor law in 1834, unwed mothers were more desperate than ever before. If an unwed mother was desperate enough to have to work in one of the workhouses, she had to live inside of the workhouse, which what was she going to do with her baby then? And if she was lucky enough to be able to find a job on her own, either by hiding the fact that she was an unwed mother or maybe finding someone who didn't hold that against her, those positions were usually live-in positions. So no matter which option she chose to try and support herself and her child, the unwed mother still had the issue of needing childcare. A lot of times these women had been employed as domestic servants and they had been either seduced, fell in love with, or maybe they were even assaulted by their employers or another member of the household. But then once the pregnancy was discovered, they were tossed out of the house and left to fend for themselves. Unfortunately, a lot of these single women who found themselves pregnant felt that their only recourse was to get rid of the child. Many women would either try to induce a miscarriage, go somewhere illegal to have someone else do that for them, or they would just try to hide their pregnancies to protect their reputation. Sometimes these women would give birth in secret and then leave their babies out in the elements to die. Or some of them would kill the baby outright and toss it into the river or a trash bin. These women were obviously desperate not only because of missed employment opportunities, but also it could take away their chances of finding a husband who would help make their life easier because now they were labeled a whore by society. Obviously, these options are all terrible, not only for these poor little babies, but also for the women who were putting their own lives at risk and also risking getting caught and going to prison. Despite how difficult their plight was, many of these mothers still really loved their babies and wanted what was best for them. And then, of course, you also had women who simply were fearful of the consequences of taking one of the mentioned options. And for these two groups of women, they were determined that their had to be another option. Copying from the business model of putting a child out to nurse, baby farming came into the picture. Baby farming was the practice of accepting custody of an infant or a child in exchange for payment. Baby farming was primarily done in Great Britain, but it was also done in Australia and the United States, though it wasn't very common there. Instead of it being an extended daycare center like the wet nurses the wealthy used, baby farms acted more like an adoption agency and they promised to find loving homes for these children. This was before fostering and adoption was regulated by British law. The practice was typically done by middle-aged women who called themselves foster mothers or nurses and they didn't regard themselves as baby farmers. Though baby farmers were paid with the understanding that care would be provided, the term baby farmer was used as an insult and improper treatment was usually implied. In theory, the system worked well. It was sort of around the clock daycare for working mothers. And ideally the baby farm would be close to where the mother worked so she could visit her baby often. In reality though, very few children who were surrendered to these baby farms would actually survive past infancy. Sadly, many unwed mothers 
really felt they had no other choice. So even once baby farms started to get a bad reputation, many turned a blind eye. Some women were able to hide their pregnancies long enough to give birth at the baby farm and then just leave their baby behind and continue on as if nothing had ever happened. Having been able to safely protect their reputation, these women would obviously never return. And sadly, this lack of follow-up from anyone checking on the baby meant that many baby farmers began to exploit the business model. Many of these self-named nurses or foster moms would take in far more children than they could realistically care for in order to increase their income. And this was, of course, during a time when many children still did not survive infancy, whether it was from poor air quality in the cities or malnutrition, because they were just straight up taken from their mom's breast after birth and placed in these baby farms with really poor diets. And so even when the baby farmers were truly doing their best to care for the children, they very often would die within a matter of weeks or months of being placed in their care. Many of these desperate mothers truly thought their babies were going to a loving, childless couple who just wanted to start a family because that's what the adverts placed in the newspaper said. Like, this one, married couple with no family would adopt a healthy child, nice country home, terms 10 pounds. This certainly would seem like a fairy tale situation to any Victorian young woman with illegitimate babies who of course were the main respondents to the advertisements. Once they began advertising in the newspapers and accepting a one-time upfront payment, many of these baby farmers quickly realized that the arrangement would be more profitable for them if the infant or child they adopted died early, thus providing room to house more vulnerable children and bringing in a constant supply of cash. If a mother returned to actually visit her child and her baby had disappeared, she was often too frightened or ashamed to tell the police, so it was really easy for the unscrupulous baby farmers to kill off unwanted or hard to foster babies. This practice eventually led to one of the darkest pages in history. Using the illegitimate situation to their benefit, the baby farmers arranged secret meetings with the young mothers. Most of the time they would send these procurers who looked trustworthy enough to take the baby along with the negotiated money. These procurers were often very convincing of their status. They looked like loving mothers, making the illegitimate mothers believe that they were not just mere messengers, but actually an adoptive mother. The encounters were never in the alleged house of the baby farmers. They were organized much of the time in places such as railway stations or basically anywhere that was a public place that would give both parties a sense of secrecy. So there are quite a few of these baby farmers that are known and I'm just going to go briefly over a few of them because there's this could be a much longer video. In the 40 year period from 1870 to 1909, eight baby farmers were hanged, six in England and one each in Scotland and Wales. One of the most prolific serial killers in the world was a baby farmer. Amelia Dreyer was a widow and a trained nurse. And it was said that initially she actually cared for the baby she received in a legitimate way. But even though she did that, a number of them still died in her care. And she actually was reporting these things to the authorities like she was supposed to, but she ended up getting convicted of neglect because several of the children died like pretty close together. And so they suspected that she wasn't doing what she was supposed to be doing. And she got six months of hard labor, which was said to have really negatively affected her. And whether she was legitimately taking care of the kids or not, it's believed she was originally. And then after hard labor, that maybe that's what changed her. But things obviously took a really terrible turn because it's estimated that she took the lives of more than 400 babies in her baby farming business. So she would strangle her victims with this white tape, wrap their bodies in this brown paper, and then weigh them down and toss them into the river. Now she had one victim that I guess she didn't weigh down enough and her little body came to the surface. They were actually able to tie it back to her because her address was on the paper that was wrapped around the baby. And so she was convicted of the infant's murder and hanged. Now, years later, the arresting officer's great, great grandson found this box in the attic and it had the tape, the paper that the little baby was wrapped in and even the evidence tag from the police department. So this is the real one you're looking at here. It was donated to a museum and this is a photo of it, which I think is just crazy. I can't imagine finding that. But Amelia Dreyer, of course, was far from the only murderess that spawned from baby farming. Margaret Waters was also one that disposed 
of children in her care and she actually came to realize it was much easier to just drug the babies with opioids which suppress their appetites and then she would left them to slowly starve before dumping them in the street in brown paper and apparently this was actually a common thing for babies because of the high cost of burials. They know for sure that five babies died in her care but they suspected that she murdered upwards of 19 babies. She was eventually arrested, tried, and hanged for the murder of a baby that was actually tied directly back to her. And then you had Amelia Strach, who helped women deliver their babies. She would tell these women that she would take the baby and help them find wealthy couples to adopt them in exchange for a payment. And then she had an employee, Annie Walters, who worked with her, who would poison the children and then dump them in trash heaps or in the river. Their landlord, though, was a police officer, and he became suspicious when he saw so many babies coming into the house and then just disappearing. So this officer actually started to do a little undercover investigation on these two women and he was quickly able to get enough evidence for an arrest. So eventually Annie was arrested and at the time for arrest she was actually holding one of her victims. Annie and Amelia were both convicted of murder and executed by hanging. Now the baby farmer from New Zealand was Minnie Dean and she was actually the only woman ever to be executed in New Zealand's history. As a result of these cases Parliament passed a number of acts to better protect babies and small children. Spurred by a series of articles that appeared in the British Medical Journal in 1867, the Parliament of the United Kingdom began to regulate baby farming in 1872 with the passage of the Infant Life Protection Act. A series of acts passed over the next 70 years, including the Children's Act 1908, and the government also introduced proper regulations for adoption and fostering. One might think and hope that this practice faded with the new protections for children, and it did fade, but not completely. In the 1930s in Nova Scotia, there was a case of William and Lila Young and the Butterbox Babies. This was basically a couple who had a maternity home for unwed mothers and then the babies would usually die within two weeks of them being there. And sadly, the term baby farming is still being used today to describe a similarly dark but a different business model. Formerly known as child harvesting, it refers to the systematic sale of human children, typically for adoption by families in the developed world, where childless couples might be stigmatized, but sometimes for other purposes as well, including exploitation and trafficking for slave labor. Baby farms have been found in more recent years in India, Nigeria, Guatemala, Thailand, and Egypt. The organization Save the Children is leading several campaigns to combat child trafficking through prevention, protection, and prosecution, working with communities, local organizations, and civil societies, and national governments to protect children from being exploited, and to also help restore the dignity of the children who have survived such terrible circumstances. In 2013, the United Nations passed a resolution designating July 30th as World Day Against Trafficking in Persons to raise awareness about the growing issue of human trafficking and the protection of victims and their rights. So, what do you guys think of this one? Had you ever heard of baby farming? I feel like this is a really devastating, sad story. I tried to end it on a happy note, but sadly, hundreds of years later, we're still dealing with some of these same issues across the world. Luckily, we do have many charities who work to help the underprivileged and fight back against the evils in our world. I would definitely urge you guys, if you ever want to help out one of these organizations that you vet them, I'll put a link down below to a website that'll help you kind of research and make sure that any organization organization you come across is actually a legitimate one so you can do that research for yourself but thank you guys so much for watching today's video i hope that you learned something today and i'll catch you in the next one